Natural Resources of the State of California, Mike Chrisman. Thank you very much and welcome to the afternoon session, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed my pleasure this afternoon to introduce our luncheon speaker, Mr. Leon Panetta, to all of you today. I know that to, m to many of you in this room, many of you know Leon, many of you have known him in mean, his past life. Leon was uh, born and raised in the Monterey area and, and was a member of the United States Congress representing the Monterey, Monterey area for 16 years. And during his uh, time in the House, the House of Representatives also served as the Budget Committee Chair. Leon has uh, been the guiding light uh, on many environmental issues over the years. And I personally can attest, uh, having known Leon for a number of years and worked with him uh, when he was a member of Congress on agricultural issues and environmental issues, he clearly is someone who understands the importance of working across the aisle, uh, working in a very bipartisan, nonpartisan way for good public policy. As a congressman, he introduced and established uh, legislation that essentially established the, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, it protects more than 5,000 square miles of ocean off the uh, central California coast. Following his service in Congress, uh, Leon was appointed director of the United States Office of Management and Budget in 1993, where he served in that capacity for two years. From 1995 to 1997, he served as Chief of Staff in the White House to Governor, to, excuse me, President Bill Clinton. Leon is a former chair of the Pew Oceans Commission and is now co-chair of the Joint Ocean Commission initiatives along with Admiral Jim Watkins. Leon has worked with Governor Schwarzenegger from the earliest days in our administration to help craft California's very aggressive ocean action plan. He provided his advice to the, Cal to the California Ocean Summit in June of 2004 and presented a strong recommendation to us in helping us to move forward. And we indeed listened to him as we crafted our agenda. In, oct in October of 2004, Leon joined the governor at Point Lobos Marine Reserve where our plan was unveiled. Our ocean action plan is a, set a national standard for management ocean and coastal resources. In 2006, Leon honors once again by addressing our attendees to the International California and World Ocean Conference down in Long Beach. He recognizes that we must take action to address many of these critical issues concerning our nation's fisheries, water quality, and of course, challenges brought on by climate change. Leon and his wife Sylvia direct the Leon and Sylvia Panetti Institute for Public Policy, where he helps us seek answers to many of these very vexing public policy questions before for us today, both on the national stage and the international stage. Now it's my, indeed my pleasure to introduce my dear friend Leon Panetta. Leon? Thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate uh, the kind introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to participate in this Governor's Global Climate Change Summit. This is, this is a very important event, and I thank all of you for your participation in this event. Uh, I'm honored to be here as a Californian, as someone born and raised in Monterey, California. But I come here as, uh, in many ways, the son of the global community as well as the son of California. I'm the son of Italian immigrants, and I understand as a result of that and appreciate the world that we live in and the global nature of that world and the fact that we have to be a community of nations working together to deal with the common challenges that face us. And as the son of California, I appreciate in particular the great beauty that is part of the state. It's in our blood, not only our mountains and our valleys and our deserts, but we have a remarkable thousand miles of coastline that stretches from Mendocino to Big Sur, from San Simeon to Santa Monica and Coronado. Some of the most remarkable national treasures that we have in this country and in the world. And those are treasures that we have to protect for our children in the future. 
I'm also honored because of the leadership that's been shown in California in dealing with these issues. And I pay tribute to the governor for his outstanding leadership, not only on climate change, but also in establishing landmark legislation to protect our oceans. In addition, I want to pay tribute to Mike Chrisman for his leadership, to Linda Adams, to Terry Tamman, who I've worked with a long time on these issues, and also to Mary Nichols. We gather here to focus on the threat of global warming to our planet. But I am here in particular to remind everyone that the first victim of global warming is our oceans. 70% of our planet is blue. You look at that world from outer space, it is a blue planet because of our oceans. Oceans that are essential to life itself, essential to our economy. If you look at the watershed communities that border our oceans, $6.1 trillion, more than half of our GDP flows from those communities. In California alone, $40 billion flow from the ocean economy. It's important to the fishing communities that depend on those resources of our oceans for their livelihood. It's important to our health. It's important to our nutrition. It's important to our recreation, to our climate, to the resources that are so important for the future. But most importantly, it is important to our spirit. John Kennedy said that our oceans are the salt in our veins, and that's true. They go to the very spirit of our country, and in many ways they go to the very spirit of the world community. Those oceans are now threatened by the very humanity that depend on our oceans for life itself. Climate change is badly damaging our oceans in a number of ways. Acidification, which is the process where CO2 is being absorbed, heat being absorbed into our oceans and changing the very chemistry of our ocean environment. And that, in turn, is impacting on the food chain that is essential to our fisheries. It is increasing the temperature somewhere between 5 to 10 degrees. We all recognize tremendous impact it's having on the polar ice sheets that are, that are melting rapidly. But it's affecting our climate and creating extreme weather patterns that we've seen over these last few years, from heat waves to floods to droughts to wildfires. It's affecting the currents in the oceans, the very engines that drive our weather systems, and creating huge problems with upwelling that provide the very nutrients that are essential to our fisheries. We've lost a good chunk of our salmon fishery along the California coast in large measure because of upwelling problems and the lack of feeding. In addition, we're seeing, obviously, the increase in sea level rise. It's projected that by mid-century, the sea will rise anywhere from 8 to 16 inches. By the end of the century, it could rise anywhere from 20 to 55 inches if we fail to, to deal with this problem. The impact is tremendous. The impact on infrastructure, on roads, on beaches, on habitats, on water supply, on coastal communities, on housing. Last Friday, I commend the, co the governor for issuing an executive order directing all state agencies to plan for the impact that will happen from sea level rise and the climate impacts that will follow that. In addition, there are two ocean commissions, the Pew Ocean Commission, which I chaired, the U.S. Commission that was chaired by Admiral Watkins, that have found that there are additional impacts that are occurring in our oceans. We are, in fact, in the process of losing our fisheries. 90% of the big fish in the ocean are gone, and other vital fisheries are being terribly depleted. 
not just true here. It's true for all of the countries that are represented here and countries throughout the world. We are seeing the problem of pollution increasing, algae blooms that are creating huge dead zones in the Gulf, in the Pacific, and elsewhere throughout the world. Invasive species are increasing. San Francisco Bay, something like 300 invasive species have entered that bay. We are seeing the problems of coastal development. 50% of our population in this country lives along the coast. We expect that something like 20 to 25 million more will move along the coast in these next few years. That will have a huge impact on ocean habitats, on wetlands. We've already lost about 90% of our historic wetlands. The governance of our oceans, and it's true here and true throughout the world, is often fragmented and conflicting. And also importantly, the funding for science, the necessary science and research that we need in order to understand the impacts that we're talking about, is virtually scandalous in this country. If we can spend billions of dollars to search for life in other planets, we, we certainly ought to be able to spend a few million more trying to protect life on this planet. It is not too late if we act now, act to pass comprehensive ocean policies, act to encourage ecosystem planning that brings together the issues of the land with the issues of the ocean. And I commend some of the states that are represented here for taking action to do that. New York, uh, Massachusetts uh, passed a landmark piece of legislation to do that kind of planning. California, having developed a partnership with Washington and Oregon to do exactly that. Fisheries need to be protected. California is establishing a set of reserves that hopefully can help restore our fisheries. We need the additional funding for science and for research to develop the mitigation, the adaptation, and the understanding that are essential to dealing with climate change and its impact on the oceans. Most importantly, we have to work together. All of us have to work together, not only in this country, but throughout the world. One of the things I regret, very frankly, is that the United States has not really been a very good partner in that effort. The Law of the Seas Treaty, which was established uh, and negotiated uh, well over 30 years ago. This country is the only industrialized country, the United States, that has failed to ratify that treaty. We are not even at the table when it comes to claims that involve our ocean resources. I am confident that a new president and a new Congress will hopefully ratify the Law of the Seas Treaty in the first part of the next Congress. Look, I recognize that this nation and the world are facing unprecedented crises, from war to global economic crisis, from energy to health care, from poverty to hunger and terrorism. But let me assert for this crowd and for this country and for the world that there is no threat that can be greater than the threat to life itself on this planet. There is no greater economic threat to this country and the world than if we fail to recognize the impact of global warming and climate change on our communities. There is no greater national security threat to the world if, if we fail to deal with climate change. We govern by leadership or crisis. If leadership is there, we can deal with crisis, if you're willing to make the hard decisions that are involved. But if not, make no mistake about it, we govern then by crisis. And crisis, if we govern solely by crisis, we pay a price. We not only lose the trust of people, but we can indeed lose our planet, and lose our oceans, and lose life itself. We owe it to future generations to build a worldwide coalition of nations to address this crisis. And clearly it begins 
with summits like this and each of us. A hundred years ago, this country had a great president, Teddy Roosevelt, who said that it was important to set aside our land, those treasures of our land, so they could be protected for future generations. And the result of that was some of the magnificent parks that we enjoy today. A hundred years later, hopefully another great president, we need to make the same commitment to protecting our planet, our oceans, and our life. That is the sacred duty that we owe to each other. It is the sacred duty that we owe to our children. Thank you very much.